I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we're speaking with Dr. Patrick Dallabetta. He has a rich background as a teacher, principal, and superintendent, and he is taking a deep dive into the challenges plaguing American elementary education in his book called The Longest Pandemic. Drawing from effective school research and his own experiences, he sheds light on the descent into mediocrity while offering actionable strategies for stakeholders. We're delighted to have this very talented author join us here today on Spotlight. We thank the team at Atticus Publishing for helping us put him in the spotlight today. And we ask viewers like you to support writers like him by subscribing to our channel and by buying the doctor's book. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. Thank you for having me, Logan. I really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Excited to talk to you today. Let's talk about the title, The Longest Pandemic. What exactly are you talking about there, Doctor? Well, the performance of elementary children has been, to say the least, poor. Um, we don't even compare with some of the countries we consider third world in terms of their achievement of their, their kids. And I've been working in my career, and, and especially with the book, to kind of identify those things that cause us to not, our kids not to perform well. And so I decided after a frustrating 15 years as a superintendent and retirement, that I was just gonna put everything on the line and, and explain what exactly is wrong. We've heard a lot about, oh, gender identity and parents involvement and this and that, but nobody really has focused in on exactly what needs to be done to improve our instructional program for elementary children. So that was the purpose of the book, to, to talk about effective strategies, talk about effective research. We've known what works for many, many years, but we can't seem to get on top of uh, making those changes to make our programs better. Do you think we need to go back to the basics of reading, writing, arithmetic? Um, do you think that's where we've strayed, where we've tried to like broaden out the topics that we cover to the point where we've watered down the essentials? Exactly. Clear back in the in the 50s, uh, there was a lot of uh, information published about what was wrong. Why are we teaching? Why are our kids not reading well? What is happening? And we've changed our reading strategies over the years to ineffective uh, strategies that, that just don't help kids learn. Uh, so yes, we 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 think that we should go back to the basics. For example, the English language is a phonetic language. Yeah. Uh, we need to we need to instruct kids and teach them the code of the language if they're ever going to adequately learn to read properly. And we've abandoned those over the years. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, a lot of states are now mandating changes from the top levels down. I think that's good. I wish it would have come from the bottom stages up. Yeah. But it looks like we are going to turn the corner and get back to the basics. And I think that's really important, particularly in reading and language arts. Yeah, it's interesting you talk about phonetics because you probably saw there was a big story recently that Columbia University finally had to do a backflip and say, hey, we made a big mistake. We were teaching our teachers not to teach phonetics when it came to reading. And that's what our language, as you said, is based upon. So you have somebody in the elite IV tower coming up with a theory that we don't need to sound out words, teaches it to generations of teachers. And who are the victims here? The students who never learned how to sound out words. That's correct. Uh, we, we started uh, teaching reading by uh, looking at pictures and giving context clues. And that simply just doesn't work. It ruined the whole idea of teaching our phonetic language. And uh, I think we need, in fact, a lot of schools are going back to the basics. And some of those changes that are happening in schools are happening from legislative bodies that are mandating changes. And I think that's good. I wish it would have come from the lower levels and inside the, the, uh, the inside the the teacher ranks itself so right well i'm sure some of the teachers knew something was wrong when they were given the curriculum they were supposed to teach but uh, sometimes it's hard to get your voice heard along the way right well right and i think a lot of our universities were steering teachers in the wrong way and they were teaching new methods that 
sounded exciting and but just didn't simply work. Yeah. So I, I think we are now moving back to the basics, particularly in reading language arts and math. And yeah. that was the purpose of the book, trying to set the stage for change. Who are you targeting this book for? For parents, for educators, for administrators, for all of the above? All of the above. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, though. In the book, I gave parents strategies to evaluate their own schools. Uh, there's all kinds of information available. All they have to do with the click of a button on a computer and figure out how well their school is doing in comparison to other schools. So I gave them strategies uh, that they could use to evaluate their own schools, uh, evaluate the, the school board that they're working with, that their children are, are um, doing. You know, So I hope it has an impact. I think... The good thing about the book is it specifically targets strategies and that parents, teachers, school board members can use to evaluate their own schools and their own programs. And I think that'll have a positive effect on overall education. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, Bill Gates was asked about his efforts to improve education in the United States. And of course, he was big beyond getting computers for every child in every classroom. He actually said that was one of his biggest mistakes he ever made. He said the most effective thing he ever did in his life was give mosquito nets to impoverished nations. And one of the biggest mistakes he ever made in his life was giving computers to every kid. You don't really need a computer to become a learned person. In fact, some of the most learned people we might ever know never worked on a computer at all. It's just a tool. You need to read, you need to write, you need to create, you need to think, you need to have critical thinking skills. Absolutely. I think a computer and the internet is a great source of information uh, for children. But as a teaching tool, I think we have made a mistake. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Tell me about your different roles in life, teacher, principal, superintendent. Which did you enjoy most? Um, and uh, how did that impact your your book? Well, I think I enjoyed teaching more than anything, yeah. Luckily, um, I was fortunate to have been an adjunct professor in a postgraduate program teaching all kinds of uh, foundations, research, and those types of things. So some of the, my students in college have taken that information and, and effectively fixed their schools and have done a good job. I'm really proud of that. But interacting with the children, I think, was always the most satisfying thing for me. And I was always concerned that my children did as good or better than anybody else. I guess I'm a highly competitive person. And uh, I was very cognizant of that. And when the testing results came out, I wanted to be number one. And generally I was, but I, I wish that competitive nature would filter down to all the teachers. I want our children to learn to read effectively the right way, and then they will perform better than ever. And that's what I'm looking for. It seems to be that there, for a lot of years, and maybe it's still the case, where teachers and teachers unions were pushing against standardized testing. Um, if you don't have standardized testing, how do you rank how well students are doing? You, you know, can. right? You can't. In fact, um, it's really interesting. Every state has a program or information that ranks their schools from one to whatever, how many ever schools they have. Um, in terms of my philosophy, I want to be at the top of that list. I want our children to be performing better than anybody else. That's my job as a teacher. I took it seriously. And uh, one, time I, I, one time in my career, I had a chance to build a brand new school and implement a brand new basic school philosophy those children at the end of the first year were among the highest achievers in the state of Arizona, if not the nation. I came back 20, 30 years later to see that same school had eroded and was now one of the worst schools in the area and certainly one of the worst in the, in the state of Arizona. And that disappointed me. I mean, they slowly, gradually eliminated what was effective for strategies that simply don't work. Yeah. I and that motivated me to do the book. Write the book. 
Tell me about writing the book. What was it like? Uh, how long did it take you? Uh, I guess in some ways it was a labor of love because you've had all these pent up frustrations over the years, seeing how that the uh, educational system is devolving and you wanted to put some answers out there. Well, I felt I knew what was wrong. Okay, but I, I spent quite a bit of time going back and looking at recent research in particular that, that showed schools that were achieving and, and, and specifically targeting those strategies at work. Um, so I had to go back and do a lot of research. It took me a year to get research that proved that effectiveness is a matter of how we teach. And so I've included, I included, it took a while, but I included all that in my book, um, all the research references and so uh, the citations. So I think people know that it's not just my opinion. This is what works. And we need to do it. The kids um, from today who are graduating high school, let's say in 2023, 2024, have they been poorly served? Do you think most of their educational careers or journeys, depending on what school district they were in? Well, I think children at higher levels, high school, are failing as a result of early education. Right. I really do. I feel very strongly uh, that we need to go back and, and look at what was effective. Uh, for example, we don't teach a whole lot or we don't place a whole lot of emphasis on penmanship and right. writing. You know, that's gone. And it's sad, sad, sad. And, and I think we need to go back and teach kids how to write, how to be creative, how to write properly, how to sound out words, how to read properly. And I think that has had a negative effect on the performance of students in high school and middle school. And we've got to change if we want to compete on an international level. Yeah, it's, it's funny. It seems like for a lot of years, um, educational professionals and their parents and parents were saying that it doesn't matter what the kid sounds like, doesn't matter how the kid writes. It, it does. People judge you by your handwriting. People judge you by the way you speak. Elocution should be taught in schools again. I mean, these are like ignored topics, you know, penmanship, cursive writing, um, you know, public speaking. Um, that's going to make a difference in a child's entire life, the trajectory of their entire life. Exactly. Um, it's funny. I have six grandchildren. They're all good students. Most of them are in college now doing very, very well. But they can't write me a legible note to their grandfather. And, and that drives me nuts, quite honestly. And I know they're the product of what didn't happen early on in their education. And I, I want to see that change. Absolutely. Well, you've given people a great tool to start that change. The name of the book is The Longest Pandemic, and the author takes a look at the state of the educational system today, primarily at the edu elementary educational level, and takes a look at his own experience at school research and looks at how we descended into mediocrity and offers actionable strategies for change. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. Thank you, Logan. I really appreciate the opportunity. Pleasure is mine. I enjoyed our talk. And to the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time this time. Until next time on Spotlight.